Now our next speaker, this closing speaker, is Chris Kubeka. I mentioned her in the opening, but I have to mention it again. She is a very, very unique, very special individual. I first met her at the DEF CON hacking conference, where we both attended a dinner with Congress people who came to DEF CON. And the Congress people were as confused as we were about the entire situation. But it was just one example of how the hacker community connects outside the boundaries, which is what we at B-Sites Tel Aviv are all about. So Chris Kubeka, this unique speaker, there's so many interesting facts to say about her. Where should we start? I first met her at DEF CON, I mentioned this. Oh, she's one of the first people to get married at DEF CON. Yes, that's a, th that's a thing. You don't just go to Vegas to get married, you go to a hacking convention in Vegas to get married. And that's what Chris Kubeka did. Uh, she is the CEO and founder of HypaSec, where she offers incident management, ethical hacking, training services, and advisory services to governments. Prior to HypaSec, Chris headed the Information Protection Group and International Intelligence for Saudi Aramco. I think they're the biggest oil company in the world. After the 2012 Shamoon attack, which wiped many of Aranko's computers, she was the one whose job it was to reestablish international business operations and implement digital security following this attack, which deeply affected not just the company, but the entire you know, region, the countries of Saudi Arabia, Qatar and Bahrain, and the entire oil production and supply chain, really, if you think about it. Chris is a United States Air Force veteran, United States Air Force is a very friendly force to the Israeli uh, Air Force, which is the friendliest force towards the IDF. It was a joke in the beginning. If you're still with me, I hope you got it. And she is also the author of several books on the subject of open source intelligence, or OSINT. Chris has so many interesting stories and amazing life experiences to share with us, so I'm just going to let her do it herself, because I don't think I could ever, ever cover the incredible life and journey that Chris Kubeka has had. Now, uh, do we have Chris live? Are we good to go? All right, Chris, I am so, so excited that you're with us. Chris is going to join us remotely from Amsterdam, and it's amazing that we can bring all of these fantastic speakers right here to Tel Aviv. Chris. Thank you so much for being our closing speaker. Chris Kubeka, the floor is yours. It is so good to be here. And thank you so much for inviting me for the closing keynote. Hopefully this will be uh, interesting for you. I'm going to describe some uh, fantastically wonderful, not sometimes so wonderful, uh, adventures I've had involving the new uh, cyber cold war by proxy, Saudi versus Iran. So a little bit more about me. Thank you so much, Karen. Um, is I do a lot of work within the critical infrastructure uh, realm from oil and gas all the way to nuclear. And uh, my first career was an aviator in the US Air Force as a loadmaster. My second career was with command and control systems for Space Command. And the picture that you see on the side, I uh, unfortunately had a little bit too much time and technology at my fingertips at the age of 10. So I was busted hacking into the Department of Justice uh, when I was allowed to use a computer. Almost eight years later, the US Air Force kindly uh, molded me into the person I am today. So we've been talking a lot about hackers today good hackers, bad hackers, and sometimes nation state hackers. And we have to remember that uh, the more things that we connect to the internet uh, as we move forward, we're going to have a lot more entry and exit points that are exposed. And almost every organization, no matter how new and how much money they have, they're going to have some sort of legacy equipment. Uh, we have to deal with nation states. We also have to deal with uh, what we call patriotic hackers that may or may not be funded by these nation states. And whether we're talking about superpowers or countries that want to be superpowers, at least of their region. Third parties leave us exposed. Uh, we cannot operate in technological isolation. And still the majority of com companies and many governments uh, don't take the risk of cybersecurity and major cyber incidents seriously. So they don't prepare properly. 
So there are a lot of actors that are in operation in the Middle East right now. Uh, some of them, however, aren't actually in the Middle East. So we're looking at uh, not so nice folks sometimes from China, North Korea, um, Russia, uh, the United States sometimes gets in the mix and uh, it causes a very, very interesting state of affairs uh, when it comes to what goes on in the Middle East. So Saudi and Iran, I quite like this graphic because we have no idea what round they're on, but they keep fighting. And Iran has certain reasons why they want to harm the Saudi Arabian uh, economy and especially the oil markets. If a barrel of oil is at a certain rate, uh, they actually make money because it costs them far much more money to actually produce a barrel of refined uh, oil. So one of my favorite quotes from a former CEO of Saudi Aramco is, never underestimate how dependent you are on your information technology and systems. It's become like oxygen. You can't live without it. Uh, you think you can live without it, but you can't. And here we all are in this hybrid event without the technology that we love and uh, is so near and dear to our hearts, we could not be at this conference. But think about all of the other things that run on uh, various different types of networks and technology. And we're talking about everyday things in your home to things like power being delivered to your home. So in 2012, there was a, a very interesting, we'll say, uh, attack against Saudi Aramco. Uh, prior to the actual time bomb that went off, there were uh, two instances of domain administrators in Saudi Arabia uh, at Saudi Aramco that were fished successfully. And this gave them kings to the kingdom, so to speak. Now, uh, at the time, Saudi Aramco did have what they called uh, a security operations center. I would not call it that. And uh, some of the IT people from Houston saw that there was indicators of compromise that someone was on the network. And they called them up over to Saudi Arabia and said, hey, you know, um, we're seeing a domain admin that's logged into 250 different devices at the same time. We're not security people, but we think this is kind of strange. Unfortunately, the manager uh, at the time uh, said, we're going through an ISO certification. You know we have auditors. How dare you call me? So then Europe started to get involved from the European headquarters. And up until two days before the attack occurred on the 15th of August, contacted the same manager on his day off and said, listen, we are seeing very clear indicators of compromises. And the manager, by the way, who was not the manager anymore, uh, said, how dare you call me on my day off? So there were some uh, cultural issues uh, between the various offices and also the fact that uh, at the time, Saudi Ramco truly did not think that they would ever be targeted. Unfortunately, uh, Pastebin was found two hours before the attack. Uh, there was a uh, time bomb, a logic bomb, and things started to get wiped. Now, um, they did try their best to protect their production but on their business network, uh, they had pretty much no real protection. They had near zero visibility. Uh, they did not encrypt internally. So you could reset your domain password over uh, a web interface that was only HTTP, completely unencrypted. So it was very easy for attackers to move throughout the network, both with the uh, domain admin credentials, but also to sniff credentials. Now, attackers aren't going to uh, strike you when uh, everybody's at work. Uh, they're going to strike when they have an opportunity. And what better opportunity than, for example, the holy month of Ramadan and on a holiday during the holy month of Ramadan? And that's exactly what happened. So there were less people who could see what was going on, who could react to the attack, and who could uh, help out uh, as quickly as possible. They had no incident management plan that involved a cybersecurity attack. They did have safety incident plans on the production, but that was it. And they had, uh, previous to the attack, uh, decided to digitize everything, which sounds like a great idea, except if all of your contact lists are now on SharePoint and 85% of your Windows computer systems are wiped. So uh, when they went to call people, 
they couldn't find lists. So of course this caused a lot of chaos and they did the only thing that they could at the time. And I believe it's the first time ever, uh, such a large company actually disconnected themselves from the internet. Now that also involved disconnecting vendors from supporting their oil production platforms. And things that haven't been in the news uh, is Saudi Ramco provided two thirds of the mobile communications for the country, and that was uh, knocked out. They also provided uh, telecommunications services and internet services for schools, hospitals, emergency services, police, and uh, these particular services also were deeply affected because the line was cut. Now, the picture that you see is actually uh, kilometers and kilometers of petrol trucks that uh, due to an industrial IoT system connected to their Windows-based payment systems, uh, they could not actually fill any of these tanker trucks, which meant that you could not get petrol if you drove to your local petrol station. And a country only has a certain amount of strategic supply. And obviously because of the uh, geopolitics involved in Saudi Arabia, their strategic supply was reserved for military use. Uh, this picture was actually taken 13 days after the initial attack by a Saudi journalist who unfortunately was never seen again. Um, one day after the attack, Qatar's Razgas was hit with a different variant. The only difference between the two variants of Shamoon were that Saudi Ramco had a burning American flag as it was actually wiping. So we've had several instances. Um, some have hit the news and some have not. Uh, soon after we recovered and implemented digital security, there was a company decision that said, we have to protect ourselves from getting our desktops and other things wiped. So the company decided to purchase a, a solution called Virtual Desktop. And this seemed like a, a magical thing, except for the fact that the third party vendor, who I believe was Hitachi, left a technician back door on all of the images. And it was set to admin admin. And the attackers uh, could easily find this information because Hitachi had actually left the user manual up on their website. And so the attackers used that information and started actually affecting the systems. Luckily, it could be stopped. But uh, we've had several variants uh, which have moved beyond just Saudi Aramco and have uh, actually targeted and aimed against Saudi critical infrastructure. So we're talking about electric, we're talking about airports. And in addition to that, uh, there have been uh, numerous physical attacks, both against uh, critical infrastructure in Saudi Arabia and against Saudi Aramco. We've had uh, lovely, jubbly drones with bombs. Hopefully that's not what Intel has given away free as prizes. And even rockets uh, come out of the country of Yemen. Now, there are lots of players in the Middle East and uh, they can affect uh, the world in different ways. So when we take a look at Syria, Syria is rather unique. Early on, uh, they had groups of what I would call uh, patriotic hackers, if not state-sponsored hacker groups. And they openly allowed their networks to be used for cyber attacks against anyone they perceived as enemies. Now, uh, a few years ago, uh, a hacker group, the Syrian Electronic Army, uh, was able to get into the Associated Press's Twitter account because at the time, Twitter did not use two-factor authentication. They were actually latecomers in the game, unfortunately. Uh, one thing that may not have hit the news was after the tweet was sent that the White House had basically been bombed and the President of the United States was injured, this affected worldwide markets. The Syrian Electronic Army also took over the Saudi Aramco Twitter account and started tweeting out uh, harmful things to the oil market as well. So uh, sometimes, as we've been seeing more and more, there is a mix between digital attacks and physical attacks. And in late 2014, uh, there was one such attack that uh, almost killed a lot of people. And the city of The Hague uh, in the Netherlands, which is known as the uh, City of Peace, where the International Criminal Court is, and a lot of other organizations like that, I was attempting to have lunch, which was a rarity because of my role. And a large man in a very nicely tailored suit came to get me from our cafeteria and said uh, I needed to uh, uh, be summoned immediately. 
when I talked to my managing director, he sent me directly to the Royal uh, Saudi Arabian Embassy of The Hague. And what looked to be at first a very simple email hack uh, turned into uh, all of the embassies of The Hague being threatened, uh, over 400 dignitaries' lives being threatened, uh, a cyber terrorism and real life terrorism group, uh, a nation state, because it's, it's all about fun with uh, you know, nation states. Nothing is crazier than nation state crazy. And several embassies had to put a disclaimer on their website about what was going on. And when I first arrived, uh, there were a lot of problems. Uh, the embassy did not use antivirus, for example. Um, and it was the IT person's second day on the job with no handover whatsoever, and they could not get a hold of the previous person. So we started locking down things, taking uh, network packet captures uh, and so forth. And I asked the IT person, I go, okay, so we've got to start locking down your email uh, because obviously your email has uh, been hacked into because there's all these suspicious emails like send us $200 via MoneyGram uh, and we'll expedite your visa fee, signed the secretary of the embassy, which did not happen. Uh, and it turns out that the password, still one of the most popular passwords in the world, 123456. I'll let you think about that. And please, if you have anything that has one, two, three, four, five, six, please change this now. So uh, with the network packet capture, one of the things that we found was there was a rootkit that was installed on the ambassador secretary's workstation. And uh, we found that it was what we would call commercial off the shelf uh, malware. Now what's interesting about this is in the news, you hear about these advanced tools that nation states use, but the problem is they're expensive to produce. And once you use them, they're burned. You can't really use them again. And they're a bit more easy to attribute. So why not for plausible deniability, use and tweak some commercial off the shelf? Well, this was the case and um, what, we, what I also found with my investigations that uh, although uh, the perpetrator who was a insider to the embassy who had diplomatic immunity, he thought that he was working for ISIS. Uh, he was unaware of the fact that actually his agent handlers were uh, from Iran. Uh, if you're into Star Trek, Deep Space Nine, there's actually a great episode where the Cardassians do the same type of thing, um, but instead of digital weapons with physical weapons. And we were having a very interesting time because uh, next door to my um, European offices, uh, we had a situation where the uh, very nice house was bought with cash by the uh, Yemeni government. And we believe that uh, the way that they got the money was actually from the country of Iran. And this is how close they were to us. So Ramco overseas, not in the embassy district uh, and right next door to us was the embassy of Yemen. So I was uh, having a meeting with my boss and I could look out the windows behind him. And one day we see that uh, we have surveillance drones uh, that are surveilling just our IT floor. And it turns out the drones, uh, pretty nice ones too, I might add, uh, were being flown by the Yemeni government's uh, embassy staff. We also caught uh, them digging into our backyard to try to get to our fiber network to surveil it. And we caught uh, several embassy uh, employees uh, inside our canteen and inside our building um, and a few verbal altercations between the two of us. And this was all happening at one time. So to give you a background, uh, there are several rebel groups uh, in Yemen. Uh, one in particular uh, has uh, said, yes, we're the ones who launched uh, bomb-laden drones, uh, but we also have seen a uh, technological um, shift from just uh, drones with surveillance to drones with bombs. They seem to love drones. And one of the ways we believe that they got some of this technology and also uh, how they were taught how to use it was because uh, they have been openly funded by the Iranian government. In addition to that, uh, there have also been joint campaigns both with Iran and with North Korea with this rebel group. 
So this was a very long incident and lasted almost two and a half months. Uh, usually they don't last that long. And in between, I uh, was called back to the embassy and it turns out that uh, things had gotten worse. And uh, suddenly uh, there were bigger extortion attempts. It uh, raised from a $200 extortion attempt to 25,000, an email was sent to several Middle Eastern countries in the country of Turkey, uh, signed by uh, ISIS and sent by the embassy's uh, official back channel email account. Now, unfortunately, although they are a great group and they're trying to be proactive, the diplomatic corps uh, did not speak to us and to the embassy uh, before they decided to act. And what they did was they sent an email to all of the um, embassies in The Hague, uh, a warning saying, hey, we've gotten information that some of you embassies are getting extortion attempts uh, by ISIS to pay you $25,000 each. And if you get this email, please contact us and we'll try to help. Now, they sent the email via CC, not BCC, and also put on that email the Saudi Arabian embassy. Unbeknownst to them, the perpetrator was still inside the email. So the perpetrators decided to respond, both to the diplomatic corps and to every single embassy in The Hague, and said, hey, hey, hey guess what? We now have your attention. The price is going to go up. And they started taunting um, all of the embassies and the diplomatic corps and started threatening. This is actually a sanitized uh, copy of the email. It's always nice to know exactly who you are up against because they were just trying to save many lives, signed ISIS and also signed the Saudi embassy. So in between this, as I'm trying to figure out who the perpetrator is and to find proof, uh, since it was a long incident and I kind of like beer, I used to stop by my local pub and um, my, uh, my good friend, the bartender and owner, before I stepped into the building said, um, you've got uh, three people that have been waiting at the bar for you for hours, just sipping tea. And I happened to be with one of my counterparts from the US, uh, from Aramco. And we thought, obviously this was a little strange. Uh, walk in, introduce myself, ask what's going on. Uh, all three of them give me uh, business cards uh, stating that they are cultural attaches from the uh, Turkish embassy in the Netherlands, and they want English lessons. Now, uh, what was quite funny about that was they all spoke English. And uh, after contacting security services, because obviously this was very strange, uh, they were indeed uh, cultural attaches with diplomatic immunity uh, from the Turkish embassy. So I was given permission to engage because they wanted to know uh, what was going on, but I had uh, protection at a distance. Uh, at the same time, I was also told that I was found on a top 10 list for uh, kidnap or, uh, well, murder. Um, I was actually number two on that list uh, for ISIS. And uh, this lasted for about two and a half weeks. It was conversational English where they tried to ask a lot of questions about the infrastructure of Saudi Aramco. And before they uh, left the country, very suddenly, uh, the lead agent uh, gave me, if you can see, uh, some prayer beads, uh, which I uh, also had checked out by security services because you never know uh, what materials or if it's bugged or what have you. So uh, after they were checked out, luckily uh, they let me keep them. And uh, it culminated with uh, the secretary's personal Gmail account being hacked into it, uh, hacked into. And when I was able to kick them out of the email system, they started sending emails from other accounts. They finally threatened uh, that they would blow up a national landmark uh, called the Kerr House uh, during National Saudi Day. Uh, where a lot of dignitaries, Dutch royalty, ambassadors from all over the world, uh, including, um, you know, ambassador from Japan and so forth. And they said, if we did not pay them the 50 million, they would actually blow up the hotel with everyone in it. Luckily, I was able to find the perpetrator and neutralize the threat. So what does Turkey have to do with it? Well, they're a very interesting country because they have been upping their uh, offensive cyber security 
uh, talent quite a bit. They have a mix between nation state and also patriotic hackers. Now, I live in the Netherlands and we've actually seen some of this uh, where there's been manipulation of some of our uh, elections uh, to uh, back uh, certain Turkish uh, related parties within the Netherlands. Uh, they've also been able to break into various intelligence agencies, including the Saudi uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And it's a somewhat well-known, uh, not very secret anymore, that uh, Turkey has aided ISIS, uh, being an oil middleman, so to speak, service, allowing convoys of uh, oil coming from that terrorist group to go through Turkey, then to be sold further on. So then we've got other groups, which are, you know, mixed between government and uh, perhaps uh, could be uh, some terrorist activity. And it looks like we, uh, what we have observed is they've been taking a page uh, from uh, Iran because they're using some of the same techniques that they used to use early on. So if for some odd reason you get really popular on Facebook and a lot of really good looking women or men just start sending you pictures and saying, hey there you might be targeted uh, because of your role uh, within your organization or your government, et cetera. And uh, they can be quite elaborate, the different types of false identities that they set up. Uh, there is some malware usage and definitely a lot of surveillance wear usage uh, if you happen to get hooked. So uh, if you don't have the people for offensive uh, cyber capabilities or surveillance capabilities, but you have the money, you can be like UAE and you can hire uh, people who used to work for US intelligence agencies. This is actually a quote from a person that was interviewed for Project Raven, where the average rate of pay was about $1 million a year to work for UAE. And it's a good way to supplement. So we have new terms, cyber mercenaries. And unfortunately, they can either be directly hired by the government, depending on their nationality, or they can work via uh, private companies to uh, skirt those limitations. So most recently, uh, this year, there was a news article that came out about me uh, because uh, the Iranian government uh, had a two and a half year campaign to try to recruit me to work inside of the country of Iran and to teach them how to hack into critical infrastructure uh, with a focus on nuclear facilities. Um, and it was, it was quite interesting because they were very persistent it started with a uh, very general, basic, vanilla uh, LinkedIn message asking for a remote teaching um, contract, which I was a bit dubious of because uh, of my because of my citizenship and various sanctions, I can't really just give services to uh, the main Iranian telecom. So. Uh, what started out as basic uh, moved to encrypted communications, lots of meetings. Um, they tried to send me various websites to look at, and uh, they offered me a lot of money. And trust me, I could have used 100,000 euro a month, which is what their offer was. And they uh, kept it going for almost two and a half years. And uh, they had set up this very, very elaborate campaign, um, many, many uh, fake websites, uh, different sock puppets or personas. Uh, the person who first contacted me was what we would call an agent handler uh, who tries to recruit you. This is actually the photograph that he uses on LinkedIn. And if you do a reverse image search on this, you can see that it's a stock photo. Uh, they had found out that I was a lecturer for Centers for the Protection of uh, Critical National Infrastructure as part of GCHQ and the United Kingdom, and that I had spoken at nuclear cybersecurity uh, conferences before, and I'd also lectured uh, on site at multiple nuclear facilities, power plants, and enrichment plants. And that all kind of came to a screeching end because during this time, I kept sending the information to an, an FBI agent who worked in a cyber division. Unfortunately, that FBI agent, I don't know what happened. Maybe he didn't take me seriously. I kept sending names and he never sent it to the appropriate offices within the FBI. Uh, 
So I thought it must not be that serious. And uh, then last January, I got a WhatsApp message from the agent handler from Iran asking me if I could send my home address so that he could send me a gift. And when I got the message, I was at a retirement ceremony for one of my friends at West Point, and I was giggling, um, having some drinks after the ceremony. And the person next to me happened to work in the counterterrorism division uh, and worked with the FBI. And he took it very seriously. And so put me in touch with the appropriate teams. And uh, obviously I did not accept the gift. Uh, and at the same time, he disclosed to me that the Netherlands government had found out that the Iranian government had hired uh, contract killers to kill two people here in the Netherlands who were Iranian exiles. So I'm not one to sit around um, and I, I wanted a little bit of revenge. So I read up a bit about uh, some new laws in Iran. And one of them was uh, because of certain religious beliefs, they decided that they would mandate any mixed gender restaurant or entertainment facility to uh, be watched by IOT cameras by the religious portion of their police. And I like IOT cameras as in I like breaking into IoT cameras. So I saw this as a great opportunity to peer into all of Iran. And it turns out you can do that too. So I put a very, very basic uh, way that you can actually find some of these Iranian cameras uh, with just this uh, dork in census.io. Uh, you can find over 10,000 and also a fun tip, they can only find, uh, buy certain um, materials from certain countries. So in this case, their most popular uh, type of IoT camera happens to be Hikvision. And if you use Metasploit at all, there's at least two modules that you can go ahead and hack into it. But because it's countrywide, you don't really need to hack. Um, they're all set with the same default credentials of admin admin. So, Luckily, I shared this with a uh, friend who is the chief strategist for a particular very friendly intelligence organization who is very, very pleased uh, that now they could use it for facial recognition, listen to voice conversations if they want, and even remotely improve the resolution. So be your own spy. Now we've talked a bit about COVID today and I'm gonna introduce a new term, BYOH, bring your own house. Everything has been turned remote, including more and more critical infrastructure. And the idea that there is perimeter security when you have to work from home, that idea is gone. Um, it was uh, talked about earlier, are uh, corporations buying uh, firewalls for their employees? Probably not that many are doing that. So uh, I scanned the internet using a tool recently and I got the top 10 countries. The yellow bar you see is the uh, total number of things that say hello on the internet. The orange bar is things that have uh, remote protocols in use that have known exploitable vulnerabilities like FTP, old versions of SSH, remote desktop protocol, BNC, et cetera. And what we can see is uh, there's a lot of vulnerabilities out there that have been in increase with uh, turning things remote, which just means another entry point that you can get into. And many of these assets in the yellow uh, actually have multiple vulnerabilities. So why is this all important? Tomorrow, July 3rd, I've been invited by the United Nations Institute for Disarmament Research uh, to uh, give a brief presentation with the head of Swiss intelligence and a senior director of Microsoft on what to do about uh, malicious attacks against critical infrastructure and what sort of joint response we should think about. Because this idea that cyber warfare doesn't exist or it's just a myth or an airport novel is no more. So these slides will be posted, if not with Security B-Sides Tel Aviv, but I also use ResearchGate. So I put in some references for everyone. 
a uh, couple of slides. And just to give a big shout out uh, to Karen and the B-Sides Tel Aviv group, uh, Dutch OSINT guy uh, helped with some of the research on unraveling uh, some of the Iranians uh, elaborate campaign against me uh, with some work with an investigative uh, reporter with the Wall Street Journal. And if you want to uh, keep in touch, uh, I check Twitter and also LinkedIn. So thank you very much, everyone.